My name is Anthony and I'm an addict. Um, I always have to take a moment and settle. Um, there's something I kind of need to say um, right up front. You know, people ask me because of the fact that I'm at the World Service Office and I travel around uh, our fellowship. Um, Sometimes people seem to get confused or ask me if I ever get confused that what I do is who I am. You know, being at the World Service Office is what I do, but it's not who I am. Who I am is an addict that suffers from an incurable illness called addiction. Who I am is a person that struggles with the same defects of character as every other person who sits in this room. Um, you know, I, I told somebody yesterday, I'm a glorified custodian, man. You know, I'm the janitor. I'm your janitor. I take care of your building and your property and make sure that nobody messes with what belongs to you. That's what I do. Who I am is much more complicated. Who I am is the person that looks in the mirror and every day hears a voice that tells him you're okay. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You don't need the meetings. You don't need to work them steps. You don't need to care about those things called defects. Look at you. You look great. I also want to say that um, long-term recovery does not mean that you have to gain 100 pounds, shave your head. Okay? Don't mean that. Um, the reality is, is that the addict that stands before you early on in his recovery made a whole lot of very bad choices. And today I'm paying for the choices that I made in those early years. Um, I'm not a person who walked in the doors of Narcotics Anonymous, um, discovered this process of recovery, and then decided, okay, I'm going to live healthy, lift weight, stop smoking, stop eating grease, stop eating meat. You know, I'm not, that's not who I am. If that's the message that you were expecting, obviously, that's not the one you're going to get. Um, instead, what I can really share is that I'm the guy that walked in the door believing he was too young to be an addict for the rest of his life. I'm the, I'm the one that walked in and listened to you people talk about how um, I could never use again and how I had to stop hanging out with all of those gangsters and criminals that I had become accustomed to running around with and how I had to stop carrying pistols and how I had to start being honest and how I had to stop um, hurting people. And uh, I sat in the rooms and listened to you say that to me night after night. And I would nod my head and think, yeah, that's okay for them. But that's not going to work for me. I, I'm, you know, I, I got the opportunity to share in Cape Town and I said there, I, I want you to visualize the very worst image of a using addict you can picture in your mind, whatever that is to you. And that's who I was. You know, I'm that, I call it the TV commercial for addiction. I'm that addict huddled up in a doorway, cleaning blood out of a cooker, unclean, unshaven, and not caring. That's who I was when I came into the doors of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, our literature talks about the fact that, you know, our disease will make us get to the point where the only things we're concerned with is the getting and finding ways and means to get more. And there are a great many of us that struggle with this premise that we are that powerless over anything. I, I had no problem. Um, I have marks on my arms that are many, many years old that are a constant reminder of just how powerless the addict that stands before you was over the disease called addiction. You know, I used to talk about my drug of choice many years ago, but the fact is, is that after a while, my drug of choice became more really didn't matter what it was. I had what I preferred, but the truth is, is I would do whatever was in front of me if I could get more of it. Um, you know, I, I've learned that talking about the using um, is only as valuable as the image that it helps to represent. Um, so I, I think I can kind of really quickly give you just a, a snapshot. I'm standing in a second floor apartment building. The police are kicking down the door. Me and several other addicts are splitting a bag of heroin. 
That's my first shot of the day. I'm sick. I don't run. I steal everybody's drugs as the door comes in and leap out of a second floor window without even looking at what was on the other side. The other image I can paint for you is I had uh, the fortune to, in active addiction, meet a woman, have two children, had those children sitting and locked up in the back of an automobile. It's about 38 degrees Celsius outside. Rolled the windows up so I could run around the corner to go score some dope. Left them locked up in the car and didn't care. That's the nature of the addict that I became. That's probably the best contrast I can give you because I did everything in between that image that you would do to become that person. People told me when I came here I had to learn how to feel. I had to come to believe in a power greater than myself. I had to surrender my will in my life. Man, I wasn't surrendering to nothing. You know, I sat in these rooms defiant, angry, and vulgar. I did not know how to express a single thought that didn't begin with have the words MF in every single sentence. That's all I knew how to say. I came here. Um, I was an angry young man. I mean, I came in Fellowship of Narcotics now. I was 25 years old. I looked around the room and I saw a whole lot of people that were in their 40s, some of them in their 50s. None of them looked like I looked. They didn't have my experience. They didn't come from that insanity that I came from every day. And that, those people were telling me, it was like my mother sitting there telling me, you need to stop using, you need to get honest, you need to change your life. And I remember there's a lady named Doreen and Carmelita that used to be in a meeting with me. And... Um, they used to look at me and tell me all the time, said, boy, you, you, you better change your attitude because you ain't going to make it. Because I, I sat here and argued with you about why the principles didn't apply to me. I sat here and told you why this program wouldn't keep people like me clean. I mean, I didn't know a clean addict. There was no such thing where I came from as an addict that stopped using drugs. Addicts went to the penitentiary, addicts went to the cemetery, or addicts used dope. It was just that simple. There were no other choices. There were no other images, no other examples. You know, my, my heroes in life were people who carried pistols and drove Cadillacs, dressed up in suits and wore alligator shoes, had funny names, robbed in the banks and stuck guns in people's faces. That was, that was who I learned heroes were. And my mother and my grandmother were trying to tell me that, you know, you got to have a white picket fence and be the first lawyer in the family and do all these other positive things. And I didn't care about any of that. All I cared about was being able to be OK with them guys that were out there behind my house every night. You know, um, I did a great many things in pursuit of uh, of drugs. Um, I harmed a great many people. Um, but most of all, as our literature says, I harm myself. Um, I turned my feelings off every single day that I used drugs. And when I came into the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous, turning them back on was not an easy thing to do. Coming to believe in a power greater than myself or that there was a new way to live was not an easy thing to do. I mean, I, I sat in these rooms and um, in about a year, I learned how to talk the program of Narcotics Anonymous really well. You know, recovery at some point becomes a really easy thing to talk about. It becomes really simple to say the right things and to act like, you know, you understand the principles that you work in the steps. I mean, I can't tell you how envious I was at times of people who were new in this program and who immediately were able to reach out and embrace the principles of the steps and work them in their life and do the writing. And that's not me. I mean, I'm one of them kicking and screaming all the way. Don't want to change no matter what kind of addicts, you know. Um, and I, I was that way because of choices that I made. It wasn't because, you know, I was different than anybody else. I had the same opportunity at the process of recovery through the 12 steps that anybody else had, I just chose not to use it. I was really comfortable with being that absolutely insane little angry kid. I liked it. I enjoyed it. 
I used to get, you know, I used to share with somebody yesterday. I used to enjoy pushing people's buttons. I used to enjoy making people uncomfortable. I used to enjoy being in the service committee meetings and being disagreeable. I used to love that role because, you know what, it made me different. It made me somebody other than everybody else who just seemed to me to be mindless drones who didn't have any feelings anymore because they had lost them to this thing called recovery. See, I, I, I know what it is to be in these rooms for five years, every single day, be of service, give rides, do what's suggested, and be absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. The insanity of addiction being alive and well and being clean for five years. I wasted my first five years in these rooms. I didn't use. God didn't find it necessary for me to relapse. I was of service. I, I even sponsored people. In the midst of that insanity, imagine what kind of example of recovery I was. Um, and you know what? A couple of those people aren't clean today. And they're not clean because I didn't provide them with an example of the pro spiritual program called Narcotics Anonymous. I provided them with an example of a reformed gangster who just didn't use dope for five years. And that's what they learned. They didn't learn how to embrace a power greater than themselves and use that power in those moments when life shows up and you ain't got nobody to call and ain't nobody that you trust around. And all of a sudden it's just you and you got no choice but to use whatever it is that's on the inside to keep you clean that moment. I couldn't teach him that because I didn't know how to do that myself. You know, I had not had the benefit of a spiritual awakening as a result of those steps. Because I hadn't worked the steps through the process to get one. I mean, I used the principle of powerlessness, the recognition of insanity, and the process of surrender. I used it every day I went to a meeting. That don't mean I worked the steps. It just means I took what it is that the three, first three steps talks about and I made it happen on a real basis, but not even as a result of a conscious choice or process. It just happened because I kept coming to the rooms. You know, the truth is is that you hear people say in these rooms, you know what, no matter what, don't get loaded and just keep coming back because despite my will, you, I will stay clean even if I don't want to. There's no way for me to come into these rooms and to at least try to be a better person today than I was yesterday and I'll not stay clean. It's just not possible. So we tell people all the time, you know what, just keep coming back and it'll get better. And somebody told me that when I first came in, just keep coming back, man, it'll get better. You know, they didn't try to explain to me and they didn't try to help me figure it out. And they didn't try to analyze what was wrong with me. They just said, you know what, just keep bringing your butt into this room. And no matter what happens, don't get loaded. And um, there are very few things that I have done absolutely from day one in this program. Very few. But the one I have done religiously is no matter what, haven't used and haven't even thought that using was a solution. You know, there are things here that we do that become a part of who we are. And we say there are no must in NA, but you know what? There are a lot of absolutes. And the one that we all learn to embrace at some point is that no matter what happens, using isn't the answer. I mean, I, I, I didn't know anything about living. You know, I've watched this bad. This is a new way to live. And the topic has came to believe, well, you know what? What I eventually came to believe in after about two and a half years was that if I kept staying around you people, I might be able to change my life. Not I would change my life. I might be able to change my life. And then when I got to year five and thought, OK, I've done this for five years. So it's somebody else's turn to be a service. It's somebody else's turn to set up the chairs. I don't need to do any of those things anymore. I turned into one of these old timers that, you know, started to flash by on special occasions and stand in the back of the room and do the ceremonial wave. Like, you know, make sure everybody saw that I was there and then walk back outside and stood out in front of the meeting and talk trash with the fellas. But if somebody said, hey, did you go to so-and-so's anniversary or birthday? Yeah, I was there. Standing up in the back of the room, waving at people to make sure they saw I was there. You know, you know, the arrogance of progressive recovery at times is just as powerful as the compulsion to use drugs. At least how it manifested itself in my life, because I'm talking about me. I'm sure that none of you suffer from the arrogance associated with being clean for a long time. Um, but you know what? 
If not, keep coming back. Um, you know, we always talk about how more would be revealed in this program. And uh, I assure you, it will be revealed. Um, you know, at some point, um, you know, like I said, I, I had five years clean, almost six. And um, I was absolutely miserable, man. I mean, just just knee deep in my own insanity. Um, you know, our second step talks about. You know, the way you recognize insanity is that you do the same things and you expect the results to be different. And you know what? I had read that on numerous occasions and did not embrace the fact that it was talking to me about my behavior. Um, because I did on numerous occasions the same things over and over again and expected the results to be different and in fact was quite baffled at times because the results turned out to be exactly the same. Nothing really changed. Because I didn't change. And I heard people say in meetings all the time, recovery is an inside job. The solution to both problems in life and recovery is in the steps. Work the steps or die. And there were a couple of other words that used to be at behind that phrase. Because um, like Kim talked about yesterday and David talked about on Friday, when I came to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous, um, you know, they refer to it as old school. I, I call it Roaring Twenties Recovery. Um, people used to confront me on a regular basis. If I was disruptive in a meeting, then a couple of the guys would pull me outside and help me to understand the error of my ways. Um, that's how it used to be. And you know what? Um, I'm grateful that our fellowship isn't like that today and that it isn't necessary for us to do that with people today. But for me, it was absolutely necessary because I was that much of a knucklehead. Um, I was disruptive. I was disrespectful. Um, you know, and that didn't go away with, you know, my first couple of years in, in this program. Um, I remember being in a service committee meeting with five years clean and somebody was saying something. And I jumped up, slammed my finger around on the table because people had to listen to what it was I had to say. And um, I disrespected the person that was speaking and I disrespected the person that was trying to chair that meeting. And because I believed that I was right and because I was an N.A. member and believed that I was entitled to say whatever I want and that in Narcotics Anonymous, we don't tell people what to do. And, you know, I espoused all that nonsense that we use as excuses for poor behavior. Um, I completely disrespected that environment of service and recovery, completely. And you know what? I walked out the door and thought it was okay, laughed about it. See, I learned early on in this program that you can often do the right thing the wrong way. And use the fact that you're doing the right thing as a justification to rationalize behavior that is absolutely inappropriate. See, I'm one of them guys that... Uh, you know, in this issue of the N.A. Way magazine, there's a little cartoon about our public image, and it shows a group of men whistling and issuing little statements at a young lady as she walks past. I'm one of them guys. That's who I was in this program. You know, I'm the guy standing out front, hat turned around sideways, young ladies walking by in them tight jeans and letting her know just exactly what I thought about how those jeans appeared on her body. And um, I did that, all of that. Married, had a wife at home, and two children. You know, see, I, I can tell you what it is to be <laughs> spiritually corrupt with six years clean. Going to meetings every single day. Being a service. Being the poster boy for NA service. Looking like everything's wonderful. Um, like I said, recovery becomes a really easy thing to talk about at some point. Much different to do what it is that you talk about. And that was my struggle. I could stand up at a podium and talk about the principles of Narcotics Anonymous. I just couldn't walk out the door and live them. Um, when I had six and a half years clean, uh, there was a series of events in my life that um, made me quickly realize that I had wasted I had wasted that gift of the first six and a half years of in this program. And I got involved with someone who was about working the steps. They used to call him a step 
uh, there's, there's actually another word that's pretty derogatory, but it means somebody whose entire life is about working the steps and that they preach working the steps and they kind of smack you upside the head with the book to get you to work the steps, one of them kind of people. And um, he pointed out to me that I had wasted the first six years in this program and that, and that I had a, an extreme need to start doing what it was that I was talking about and, uh, and stop killing people because that's what I was doing. I was killing people. Um, and we started the process of working the steps the way that it's suggested. And when I started to do that, I started to discover several things. One, I realized that I lacked any significant belief in anything other than my own arrogance and, and ego. Uh, the second thing was is that I really, because of early childhood experiences with religion, you know, I just tell people I'm a recovering Catholic. Um, but what that did to me was it gave me a, an extreme prejudice about God and things connected to God and the use of the word God. And, and so it was really, really difficult for me to embrace this premise that I had to believe in this thing I couldn't see and that I couldn't touch, but it, that it was the thing that was going to save my life when I needed it. Um, but the process of going through the writing in the second step really helped me to see that insanity in my life was directly connected to the fact of my behavior and that if I didn't find a way to believe in something other than myself, that recovery would not be possible for me. Um, then when we started to do the third step and it was about a process of surrender, you know, I was one of those people who used to refuse to get on their knees. I used to have this whole rationalization for why I wasn't going to get on my knees because, again, all of that related to my experience of religion as a child. And um, when we went through the, the steps, I'd say that the first time I got on my knees to pray, I had almost seven years clean. And what he explained to me was is that getting on my knees was really only about an acknowledgement that I believed that this power was greater than I was. Didn't matter what the power was. Said you can make it, make it the ashtray in the meeting if that's what you can find a way to believe in. But whatever it is, you got to humble yourself to it. And the only way you demonstrate your humility is to get on your knees. Now he said you could lay down on the floor if you want to, but you got to get off your feet in some fashion. And um, he said, "Here, I'll do it with you." And held my hand, and we knelt, knelt together. And um, he really taught me how to pray. Taught me how to exercise my belief in a power greater than myself. And um, we went through the fourth step and the fifth step and the sixth step. And, and, and the more I got into this process, the more we uncovered, the more I discovered that, you know what, there was a real person inside and that he was a person who was really afraid. He, was, he wasn't this awful, terrible uh, person that I portrayed myself to be. He was actually a person that was quite sincere and tender and caring and had the capacity to love and 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 you know I started you know doing the process of the six and seven step and just kind of letting go and and not finding it necessary to protect myself from you see I used to think that I had to always protect myself from you that you were going to harm me in some way that if I allowed myself to become vulnerable in your eyes that one of you would take advantage of me and so I always sat in these rooms with a little reservation about the degree to which I was willing to be vulnerable. Um, and that process just kind of got all of that garbage out of the way. And it stripped away years and years of denial and arrogance and anger and ego. And, um, you know, it, 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 it allowed this spirit to waken. And you know what? I can't, I can't tell you the... You know, it wasn't like, it was like a switch. It was like a switch. Somewhere between the seventh and the ninth step, it was like a switch. And the freedom that came. I, I wasn't ashamed anymore of what I had done. I stopped feeling guilty for the harm I had caused. I started realizing that I could, I could fix some of the harm I had done. I could, I could do better. I could be a better person. And you know what? I, it got to the point where that's all I started to want. I mean, when I first came here, I wanted new car, new woman, new job, diamond rings, new clothes, pocket full of money, because I saw you with that. And I thought because you had it, I had to have it. And that if I didn't have it, something must be wrong. 
Because I heard recovery was an inside job, but sitting in the rooms with you guys and your pretty cars and your pretty women and your pretty houses, I didn't internalize that recovery was an inside job. It looked to me like recovery was an outside job and that the more you got, the more you had and the more I was supposed to have. Um, But all of a sudden, none of that stuff mattered. You know, that little Mercedes Benz that I had fantasized about wanting, it didn't matter. The... The things that I had made important in my life, they stopped mattering. All I cared about was my ability to not use no matter what and my appreciation for God and my understanding. I went through the 11th step in that process and, man, you know, it talks about a spiritual connection and a, and a raising of consciousness with that power greater than myself. And um, it helped me to create an absolute in this program. I know beyond any doubt that no matter what happens to me, I know that a loving God is going to keep me through it and that I'm going to be okay and I don't ever have to think about using it. And you know what? I have had a great many things happen to me in this program. I've experienced the death of friends and family, the loss of uh, financial uh, security, the troubles and difficulties in interpersonal relationships. I mean, like I said, I had a wife when I walked in the door. I still have that wife today, 28 years later. She's a recovering addict. So I want you to imagine what it's been like living with a recovering addict for 28 years. Okay? We got a little glimpse of, thank God my wife didn't stand up here and have an opportunity to take my inventory. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, as soon as she got her own program, she realized she couldn't take my inventory no more. She had to take hers. Um, but, you know, the truth is, is that in these rooms, once I was able to come to believe that this program would work in my life, I learned how to be everything it was that I didn't know how to do. I learned how to be a father and a husband and an employee and a student and a uh a friend, you know, I have people in this fellowship that I count on and there are people in this fellowship who count on me. And, and I tell people all the time, man, it, it, if, you can't, if we can't find a way to do anything else, find that friend that's going to be there for you no matter what, because you're going to need them. My experience is, is that life shows up even when we don't want it to. And when that happens, what we have to revert to is the principle that we hold dear on the inside of our life and the friends that we hold close. And that's who gets us through. But I also will share with you that I've had the experience of having one of my enemies be the person who on that day saved my ass. So I've kind of learned to, you know, I was one of those judgmental kind of addicts. It was really easy for me to look at people and to create a judgment about who they were and then treat them like that forever. Um, and the fact is, is that I had the occasion where none of my friends were around and I had a major crisis in my life. And the addict standing before me was a person that I didn't particularly care for. But on that day, that addict reached out to me. On that day, that was the addict that saved my life. And so the thing that it taught me is, is that, you know, sometimes the judgments we create as people don't serve us real well. And that a great many of us share a common principle and a common belief. And that as long as we do that, you never know who it is that may save your life. So before we cast judgments on each other, you know, I, I had to learn that sometimes, although someone may not act the way that I think that they should act, it does not give me the right necessarily to judge who they are. Because one day I may have to reach out to that person to save my ass. You know, um, the lessons that I've learned in this program have been extremely difficult at times. And sometimes learning that getting out of my own way is the best thing that I can do just for today um, has been an extremely painful and difficult lesson to learn. You know, I'll leave you with this. Um, Somebody once told me that the way to always determine if I was still living in the reality of having come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity and help me to improve my life was that I needed to be able to enjoy a journey that was spiritual in nature, even on the detours. 
And as long as I could still enjoy the journey, then I was still. Thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed this recording and would like to listen to other talks on recovery, please visit our free website at recoveryspeakers.com. We have assembled the largest historical recovery audio library in the world and are adding new talks each day.